Hello there, this is the Talking City podcast, the Manchester City podcast from the Manchester Evening News. My name is Joe Bray and we're here to discuss what was an absolutely ridiculous 7-0 win in the Champions League against RB Leipzig. If you listen to this podcast earlier in the week, you will have heard us say it was going to be a tight game. We didn't know which way it was going to go and that went completely out the window after about 20 minutes at the Etihad on uh, on Tuesday night. Joining me to us um, a night that I've still not really got my head round. Simon Bykovsky, how are you doing, Si? Yes, I, I've not got my head round it either, but um, such is Erling Haaland, isn't it? Let's put it down to Erling. Well, I think we'll uh, have plenty to discuss around uh, that, that striker in particular. Um, I, I, I genuinely don't know where to start, so I think just start... <laughs> At the beginning, the team sheet came out. We'd, we'd thought it was going to be a really tight, controlled game. The team sheet sort of supported that. Four central defenders again. The four experienced midfielders, only one winger. It felt like Guardiola was going for control. Didn't really turn out that way, did it? No, no. Well, it, yeah. It, it did in a way. It did in a way. Um, I think... Uh, what we did have was a, a Kevin De Bruyne at or near the top of his game, which we haven't had for a while. Um, and Kevin De Bruyne at his best allows City to play at a quicker pace. Um, we we saw a quicker pace than we've seen for a while with this City team. The start of the game was absolutely electric, wasn't it? Like Leipzig were pushing a really pressing City hard in their in their third like. Uh, like no Premier League team maybe bar Liverpool is able to do um, but then once City were able to break that press they then moved really quickly themselves um, so it was kind of a it was a complete departure from the first leg um, despite the fact that the, the team was kind of like you say set up really for control yeah, and I think Guardiola made that point. He said, yeah, it looks defensive, but actually the the way that he wanted them to play wasn't really defensive at all. And it was more to counter what Leipzig had to offer and, and did offer in, in the first leg. And uh, we'll, we'll go through Guardiola's very interesting press conference uh, shortly. But it was uh, City got off the mark through what was a very debatable penalty, didn't they? It was, I mean, let's be honest, it wasn't a penalty. <laughs> no. No, um, I, I don't. I mean, thank goodness it wasn't a major talking point is all I will say because, um, you know, it, was, <clears throat> it, it wasn't a penalty and no one in the stadium kind of appealed for it. It was one of those where we saw the referee was going over for, for, to check something and we, didn't, we had no idea what it could be. Um, I mean, it's kind of more of a penalty in the Champions League than it is in the Premier League because the standard of refereeing is a bit more wild in the Champions League. Um, and there were also kind of similarities to where um, Liverpool got a penalty at Bournemouth at the weekend. You know, it's one of those, it, it's hit an arm in the box and the player doesn't know much about it, but his arm is is out a bit. Um, and yeah, it's um, City got a little bit of luck there um, and also a bit of luck when I, th- I think the the Edison thing was bigger, Edison came charging out of his goal for for no real reason and absolutely walloped the the Leipzig player, um, and the referee somehow managed to give City a free kick and book a Leipzig player for dissent. So I think it was offside. I, th- I think he made a, a an action with his hand that suggested it was offside, which is the only way I can explain City getting a free kick in that situation because. If it wasn't offside, then Edison's in trouble, surely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, like I say, standard of refereeing in the Champions League and City have been on the wrong end of those decisions enough for them to know all about that. And, you know, it was funny, I think it was in your morning piece, wasn't it, that um, the player who gave away the handball for the penalty that wasn't a penalty was the player who handled the ball in the box at the end of the first leg, which was absolutely a penalty and nothing was given, so... Sometimes these things even themselves out. Well, they say that, don't they? At the end of the season, decisions generally even themselves out. But And in this tie, it has done. And if City had got that penalty at the end of the first leg, they'd have been 2-1 up and they went 2-1 two, two up in, in the same instance. So I, I think they deserved it as well on the balance of play. They'd created a few chances. The fact that they didn't score in the 
sort of pinball in the box just that, that led to the penalty was was quite amazing anyway. I think Ilkay Gundogan had fired one over the bar and uh, Haaland had been put through and it was City were on top and did deserve to go ahead and then suddenly one was two because Kevin De Bruyne smashes forward and, and unleashes a ridiculous effort onto the bar and Haaland's so fired up from his uh, from his goal he's he's there to, to head in and I think Haaland deserves credit as well for um for the build up as well from the moment that City that Leipzig kicked off he raced down and closed the ball forced a dodgy clearance um we, we speak about Haaland's goals he scored a lot of goals yesterday broke a lot of records I think this was one of his better all-round performances and we keep saying this every time he's he's playing in the last few weeks he seems to be becoming a bit more involved now I think Guardiola said yes um Leipzig pushed higher so he's got a bit more space to go into but he was still all o- like all over the pitch, coming deep to link play. There was a couple of times where he had no real right to win a ball in midfield, but set City on the attack. And I think there was one chance that Jack Grealish could have scored. It all came from Haaland. That second goal came from Haaland as well. And a lot's been made of, yes, he, he scored a lot of sort of tap-ins, if you like, and, and close-range goals, even just in this game. I think his all-round play was as good as we've seen him at any point this season. Yeah, yeah, it's quite funny how he's a, a big tapping merchant now. Um, it's <laughs> yeah, strange, strange old game. Uh, yes, his his all round play was excellent, and his his play, particularly for the second goal, um, was one to say this is how he's kind of adapting to City, and this is what he can bring outside of just scoring goals. Um, Jamie Carragher was pitch side. Uh, last night so he got a, a good view it's you know it's February when Carragher said Haaland's at the wrong club and we're only seeing 60% of him um, so uh, uh, you know you do hope uh, Haaland brought that up when he went and did his interview with them uh, after the after the match but it, it was yeah it, it was an unstoppable performance uh, and that was very much the five goals but also everything that came about Haaland's so quick so to have him bearing down on you um, at full pace is quite something but then you know the goalie kicks it out and even then it's a brilliant header back to De Bruyne and it's good reactions and a really good header to to get the rebound off the bar and, and sort of guide it down and into the net and to stay on side as well and to stay on side yeah um, faultless faultless performance from him 10 out of 10 in your ratings there was no real no real question about that was there a 10 out of 10 uh, no 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 um and you know i try not to give 10s i really try not to give 10s i think i've only given him one other 10 but i, I can't think of too many times i've given any other players 10 um i think i gave harland and foden 10 for the derby when they both scored a hat trick um but like what what else could you get <laughs> Because you give him after five goals and and that performance and you know had he stayed on the pitch for the last third of the game I think we could be talking about seven or eight. I think Sergio Guerrero has come out and said that like why did he take him off Guardiola because he, he could have scored six or seven or or more and and Haaland said that didn't he that as he went off he told Guardiola he wanted a second hat trick but in response I, I liked Guardiola's answer he said if we give him all the records before he's 23 he'll have nothing to do for the rest of his career and he's, he's got to have something to aim for and on, on that sort of form you, you feel like he he will he will get those sort of records and he, I mean he got enough last night didn't he he became City's all time top scorer in a single season with, with 39 he was the quickest player to score 30 in the Champions League by um, by age and also a number of games and only the third player to score five in, in a Champions League game it's not not a bad night, is it, for uh, for, for Haaland? I think he can uh, let Guardiola off off bringing him off for that uh, double hat trick. But he also said in one interview that basically read between the lines. But City know how to win the Premier League, and they brought me in because they've not won the Champions League yet. Is this the kind of game that City did? have been waiting for him to make the difference in those big games He there was no doubt he was going to score that penalty when it was nil-nil was there and after that it was all about Haaland to take the game away from from Leipzig this was this felt like a game where this is why City bought him yeah absolutely um, but I would also say that you know Palace away 
um, or even Palace at home is a reason that they they brought him in because he's there to to score the goals that they otherwise wouldn't. But yeah, this was you know it was a a tough night and Guardiola had built it up into being a tense like on a knife edge could go either way, um, and all the players had come out before the game and said, "Oh, we need the fans. We need the fans to be at their best because we really need." this result in this game and you don't do that unless you're really you know genuinely concerned that the result could go against you um and you know you look at what Guardiola said after the first leg like you know people expect us to win 5-0 but these are a really good team and then within minutes that looks absolutely ridiculous because Haaland has just steamrolled them and um you know turned what was a, a really sort of tense evening into a big stroll where every time Haaland gets the ball you think he's going to score I think he had already had eight shot eight eight shots um and all were on target so that is that is clinical precise finishing that yeah it's I think I turned to you after his maybe fourth or fifth and said yeah but our city better with Haaland? Of, of course they are. <laughs> when, 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 when he's like that, you, can, you can't argue that, that that they're not at all. And I, th- I think it was um, uh, I forget the name, but one of the Leipzig players basically said, "We've got no chance. We ha- we had no chance in that game because City were City had made the mind up they were going to win that game, and they did." And I think Marco Rose afterwards, the manager said, "I told you what Haaland was going to do before the game. He's obviously managed him before. He was like, there's nothing new I can say about him, but." He is he is that sort of player who can who can take the game away from you on, on his own and no it was a, it was an absolutely fantastic performance and to, to your other point on the Champions League like yeah Hal is not going to get that space to sort of press the goalkeepers and charge about the defence every game but he's more likely to get it in the Champions League than he is the Premier League and so that is where he's kind of more equipped to win City the Champions League than he is the Premier League but you know he's very well equipped to win them both. Yeah, and he may well may well uh, do so. Obviously, City have a, a, a long, long way to go in the Champions League, but this it felt like a bit of a statement of uh, of intent. And a lot of teams around Europe who are still left in the Champions League will think, while seven nil is a a very, very good scoreline. I do want to talk about Kevin De Bruyne because uh, Erling Haaland obviously scored five, broke all the records, has taken all of the headlines, but. Kevin De Bruyne was brilliant, wasn't he? <laughs> Just behind him, running the show. And if, if that is back to basics, then I think he's redefined what basics are. Yes, yeah, it was It was one of those performances from De Bruyne where he is just a joy to watch. Um, and everything kind of came off for him where it really hasn't in, in the last few weeks and whatever. And, uh, you know, absolutely thunderous effort off the underside of the bar for Haaland to to score his second and then that um his final goal was was really really good um it just typical typical him really um he yeah i think there was there's been a lot written about de bruyne this week and kind of after he he stopped at uh, crystal palace and talks about being an old man not necessarily being meaning he was ancient but it kind of all fitted into a narrative that he was kind of on his way out and um, you know, were we still living in Kevin De Bruyne's world? And the answer is yes, yes, we are. Um, and I think you know, from a city point of view, Haaland is the one who gets all the headlines. But I think you see the best of Haaland when you have De Bruyne at or near his best, because um, there's still no one who's quite able to kind of gel. Um, the attack quite like De Bruyne. Gundogan has done a very, very good job at it this season uh, and certainly in recent matches and is a very good player, but he's he just doesn't have that that vision um, that De Bruyne has got. And, you know, again, if City is to go far in the Champions League, they will need um, De Bruyne in that kind of form. That's it. When 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 De Bruyne is is playing well, he he is the, the best in Europe in that position, and 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 you need him. It, it was from the sort of the first minutes where him and Bernardo were linking on that right hand side, and he was whipping crosses in, and they might have reached the man, they might not have done. There was one outside of the boot effort that looked to the back post. It didn't get there, but you could just tell he was in the mood. There was a quick free kick that sent Gundogan into the box for an effort. It was a different De Bruyne than we've seen from the last couple of games, where he did look a bit frustrated. He was giving the ball away. 
and he, he just looked like he was in the mood and he was going to make a difference in, in that game. Obviously, the effort that came off the bar, but he was involved in, I think, at least two or three of the other goals and his set pieces were brilliant. And no, it, it was it was one of them games where you, you sort of realised you were watching a good player at the top of his game. But again, Guardiola brings him a little bit back down to earth in, in the press conference. I asked him, like, you, you asked him to go back to basics, if you like, and then he's put in that performance, you must be really pleased. And he said, yeah, I am. But De Bruyne has to realise that when he's like that, he's unstoppable. But he still has to do the simple things right, which is keep the ball and, and do the passing. And he sort of indicated that not every game will be like the Leipzig game. And he still sort of challenged De Bruyne to be a bit better in those basic things. We, we were sort of talking about this. It's a bit of a conundrum because when De Bruyne is at his best... He is taking risks. He is giving the ball away, isn't he? So, yeah. Well, that is the um, in the same way that like Haaland suits these games more. Um, De Bruyne suits these kind of fast-paced, both teams kind of losing the ball and breaking on each other um, transitions. The fancy word for it. Um, you know, he De Bruyne, especially as he gets older, seemingly is far better at those kind of games than he is the the slower control um, base games where there's kind of like less ability to take risks because there's sort of not as much space. Um, but, uh, but with that as well, more kind of opportunity for frustration because, you know, De Bruyne is, is a very kind of emotional player with, you know, let me talk and everything. He's he's quite happy to uh, to give it out on the pitch to anyone. I think he got booked last night for dissent. Um, but there's kind of more opportunity for frustration to set in when you're not kind of enjoying the sort of game that you like to um, play. And he obviously enjoys things more when there is space for him to, to exploit. So yeah, not every game will like be like that. And I can see there is kind of more of a reason now to to leave him out in games where you absolutely think it's going to be like that but then City have shown against Leipzig um in the second leg that they can kind of break from the from the control game if they sort of confident enough in in the tactics it does feel a little bit like Guardiola just laying the seeds that De Bruyne won't play every game where he might have done in in the past that there will be games that are suited to him but City have those players that are a bit more sort of helpful for for controlling games, and uh, we we saw it a little bit yesterday. Obviously, he had the the four the four centre backs. He said they were all there just because they don't make mistakes, and if they do, they they reset very quickly. And it, it was it. I I thought it was significant that you had Rodri, De Bruyne, Gundogan, and Bernardo. It seems like that's Guardiola's go to. They're the the experienced four players, the the players who give you that sort of solidity in midfield. Yeah. Bernardo was on the on the wing, but I think Guardiola said that was to, to sort of stop the fullbacks from from countering. It meant that on the uh, it meant that he left as and Phil Foden on uh, on the bench. Now a lot of people uh, did did think that that was a risk. Guardiola said no, it's not. It's more for control. Um, it, it feels like for me that that Guardiola has a sort of set core of players who are going to continue in in this Champions League in these big games, and it it, it comes from De Bruyne and Gundogan and, and Bernardo. Yeah, and Grealish, um, who is terrific at at keeping the ball, and you know you look at Grealish and Bernardo and Gundogan and Rodri, and um, you think when was the last game they didn't play really 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 well in um you know I sort of remember Rodri being bad when they lost at Spurs um and he was really bad then but since he's been out of this world um and Grealish and Bernardo again have just kind of lifted their their games Grealish has been on it since the World Cup but you know he he's continued in that level and he's kind of overtaken Mares in the sense that Mares was was doing a bit more than him in the first few months after the World Cup. Um, but Grealish has elevated his game even further and that's why he's starting ahead of Mares, even though 
you know, Mahrez has got so much going for him and he's got the experience and that mentality. He's kind of missed the Champions League. He, he absolutely loves those kind of knockout nights. But So for him to be on the bench, there must be some other players in seriously good form. Uh, and and they are. Um, so, you know, City are in that space where they've just got key, key players um, performing really, really well at the minute. And the key for them will be to to maintain that once they've had two weeks away from from the main group again because you know I bet Guardiola is absolutely delighted to have that they've reached this level but now he knows that there's a chance for them to lose it again well we, we've been saying that haven't we they've been talking so much about putting a run together now they're on that run they're they're playing consistently. There's a level of performance from a lot of players. And even Mahrez, as you say, he hasn't done badly at all when he's played. It's just that other players have been better and that must be a, a little bit frustrating for him. I think this was Grealish's 12th start out of 13 and the only one he didn't play was was the FA Cup. He seems to have that left wing on lockdown and it's it's now between Mahrez and Foden to, to play on the other side and apparently now Bernardo as well so it's it's a good problem to have Guardiola said he wants to be in in three competitions after the international break because it'll just help drive on in the Premier League and help uh, help City sort of keep that rhythm and momentum going they've obviously got to get to the cup semi-final against uh, Burnley in the quarter-final at the weekend but it, it seems like City are finally at where Guardiola wants them to be and I, I got the feeling Guardiola was just quite happy and quite relaxed and the the telling point of that was that he uh, revealed that Julia Roberts is his idol in the uh, the press conference which we thought we had everything we needed from Guardiola and then he said let me just tell you Julia Roberts is my idol and even if we lose the champ even if we win the Champions League it won't compare to the disappointment that when Julia Roberts went to see Man United instead of City when she visited Manchester it was a little bit bizarre but it kind of continued the narrative of Guardiola saying it. He's he's keeps saying that City are going to be a failure whether they win the Champions League or not. He, he seems to have completely bypassed any frustration about the outside narrative when it comes to the Champions League, and he's he's embracing it a little bit now. Do you do you think that's a good uh, a good sort of stance and a good attitude to have? No, absolutely not. Um, yeah, I mean, you were in the press conference. It sounded absolutely wild. Um, it, it was ridiculous. Like yeah. <laughs> very elaborate Julia Roberts tale for um, sort of very little kind of reward or punchline or like just just an odd thing to say. Um, and also, yeah, this idea that like, oh, we're a failure. I'm a, I, I'm a failure. It, it's just kind of a bit weird. Um, I'm not really on on board with it. I, I can I can see where he is coming from, but it's a drum that I don't know why he's banging it so relentlessly. Like you know, most of the not most of, but he made a point in the pre match press conference with Leipzig of of saying that. Um, he made a point of saying it before the first leg of the last sixteen game. At Leipzig, uh, and it and it's kind of like yeah, we we, we get it, um, but also you've just won seven nil, and you're talking about being a failure. Um, and he, of, of course, he, he said you know he doesn't he, he doesn't agree with that idea, um, but also many people also don't agree with that idea. So it's just a bit odd to be bringing it up every press conference, um, as if you know it, it's some. It's some huge thing that is accepted by everyone um, when it, it just isn't. So yeah, um, he he lost me, he lost me with that, and he lost me with Julia Roberts. Um, but there we are. You know, I, I I very much enjoyed Erling Haaland's interviews after the game. I thought he was uh, he spoke very well, um, and you kind of got you you felt like he was talking after a 7-0 win whereas you didn't necessarily feel that with Guardiola did you? I thought he was but in the sense that he had the protection of a 7-0 win so he could let a few things off his chest where say against Tottenham and the 4-2 win he had a lot of frustrations he wanted to get off his chest about his team this time he was calling out the, the Twitter guys and people who uh, maybe doubted his his team selection and 
sort of doubted city in in, in europe and, and and that sort of thing and you can do that when you when you've won seven nil so convincingly yeah 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 and you know and he, he's done it a few times recently again hasn't he basically saying i i know more than anyone else i know what i'm talking about and you know it it is true um and sometimes it does need saying um i just think yeah you have to strike that balance between picking your moments to do it and you know not ending up sounding like nathan jones having a pop at a non-league manager when you've just won a very big game that is is that kind of thing where you're like how often can you bring this up without it looking a bit odd yeah but uh, yeah again if you if you win 7-0 and you're Guardiola you can probably do do what you want can't you um, let's have a look to the quarter final draw there's uh, a couple of ties still to be decided as we uh, record this on Wednesday we can pretty safely assume that Real Madrid will, will get past Liverpool and if Liverpool get through then they will fully deserve to do that Napoli and Frankfurt are the other ones uh, who still need to be decided and then City could face AC Milan Benfica Bayern Munich Chelsea Inter Milan and then one of Real Madrid or Liverpool and one of Napoli or Frankfurt so Simon who do you want in terms of where would you like to go and uh, who do you think City will want to play and want to avoid <laughs> Personally, Napoli would be great, and uh, and I think that would be a, a a two-legged tie for the for the ages. I think um, that's got kind of Napoli winning nine eight written all over it, um, with a sort of eighty ninth minute penalty missed for Man City or something like that. Um, I mean, City won't want to get Madrid because Madrid are Madrid, um, and. Certainly after last season, they kind of showed it more than ever. Um, if may, maybe you want to avoid Napoli because they're the the kind of the form team, but at, at the same time, I think they, um, you know, I I don't think they've played against a team that are of the standard of City. Um, you know, they played a, a very out of sorts Liverpool. Um, in the group stages so that was kind of the closest they came but I think City would be a real test that they haven't had either in the Champions League or in Serie A this year um, I, I'm, I'm talking about Napoli as if they're through but you know they are 2-0 up from the from the first leg and Madrid as well 5-2 up um, so I've picked the two that we don't know are through yet which is good um, other than that I, there, there aren't really any um, any teams for City to be concerned about, I don't think. You know, I think you'd take either Milan side. Um, Benfica, again, have done very well. Um, but had one of the easier last 16 draws. Um, Chelsea, again, I think City wouldn't have anything to fear from Chelsea over two legs. Although they do have a bit of a, a blind spot against English teams in, in Europe. Yes, yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, that's got Raheem Sterling winner written all over it, hasn't it? Um, yeah, Munich are are not the great force that they have been. Um, and, you know, there's obviously João Cancelo over there who can't seemingly get a game for for them when he wants which would be sort of a, a a subplot to to that tie but you know I don't think Bayern Munich are as strong as they have been in um the last few years certainly you know when they won it in 2020 and they just looked absolutely unstoppable and now yeah not not so much this kind of struggling to keep top spot in the in the Bundesliga I'm sure they will win the Bundesliga because they they do it every year but um it, it's it's not been as plain sailing for them um so yeah I it, basically for for City <sighs> Oh, I don't it's know. an intriguing job, isn't it? Avoid Madrid at all costs, but maybe you'd want Madrid over two legs rather than one leg because there's less chance of kind of fortune or whatever Real Madrid have that no other club has kind of taken over in a final. Um, but it is a very interesting draw, yeah. Who would you want? I think if I was City, I'd want someone like Benfica, maybe Chelsea just because they're 
they're very beatable this season. City have beat them, what, three times now already this year. Um, as you say, either of the Milan side shouldn't hold too much fear. I, I think they would want to avoid Munich just because there's a lot of players who they know well and have individually hurt them in the past. So uh, Mane, obviously Cancelo would be nailed on to have a fantastic game. You've got players like Leroy Sane who sit, you know, inside out. It, it feels like a, a, a tie where there's just less for City to control, less for them to sort of know about. But no, I, th- I think you're absolutely right. They can avoid Madrid. That is what they'll be looking to do. If, if City could get um, anyone but Madrid and hope that Bayern face Real Madrid, I think that would be a, an ideal draw. And obviously, we'll find uh, we'll find out the route to the to the final as well. The semi finals are drawn at the same place, so uh, you can find that all on the Manchester Evening News on Friday, I believe. And we'll uh, see what City's route to uh, a potential final in Istanbul looks like. You can join us after the break of this very podcast, and we will be looking forward to uh, City's FA Cup quarter final against Vincent Company's, Company's Burnley. Hello there, welcome back to the Talking City podcast and we will be looking forward now ahead to the uh, FA Cup quarterfinal against Burnley. But first, Simon, I believe you have some uh, contract news for us. Yes, yeah, uh, nothing earth shattering, but um, expecting uh, Julian Alvarez to sign a new deal at City uh, very soon. He's obviously impressed, impressed a lot, signed January of last year. Um, and then kind of his form um, in Argentina ensured that um, he was given a chance to stay at City this season. He's done very well. Um, he has... Let me see. Let me see. Let me get my spreadsheet up. How many goals has he got? How many goals do you think he's got? Is he in double figures yet? He is in double figures. He's got 10 and 5 in the Premier League. Um, yeah, so he's done very well, um, and obviously he signed kind of as a, a a junior player who it wasn't certain that he would make it at City, and so he's signing on on much better terms now. Now that he's a established first team player and World Cup winner, so you know it's it's not um, unusual for City to tie down um, players kind of within. 12, 18 months of them signing on on, on better terms. Um, but it, it is a mark of how well Alvarez has done that he has been chosen to, to do it. And also the fact that he's got it kind of in the middle of the season when normally City wait until the end of the season to, to do all this just kind of reinforces um, how how pleased everyone everyone is. I would imagine coming back from Qatar with a World Cup medal would uh, would help his case in in sort of showing what he can offer City, but also just the, when he sort of replaces Kevin De Bruyne and he, he's shown that he's not necessarily just a replacement for for Erling Haaland. He can offer something different and play play behind him as well. And he's he's got that sort of thankless task of playing sort of second string to a superstar striker. He, he seemed very happy to do that for Lionel Messi at the World Cup, as as you would be, but. At club level, I think it probably takes a lot out of you to to sit on the bench when you feel like you should be starting. So for him to chip in with those ten goals and and put in some sort of a lot of tireless performances shows just how well he's done. And yeah, if, uh, if in in that situation, I'd, I would imagine he's had a few suitors looking around him as well and and maybe saying, "Come on, you can come here and and play every week." So I, I think that's uh, quite a good a good signature for uh, for City to get and uh, it'll be interesting to see how he sort of fits in City long term now he's uh, he's got that bit of uh, a bit of security in his in his contract and uh, one game that he may play is uh, is the FA Cup quarter final against Burnley it would be it, it feels harsh to drop Erling Haaland after a, a five goal haul but this is one of the games where you would normally expect Alvarez to maybe be playing his own up front or is it a quarter final and a chance of reaching Wembley and you've got to play your strongest team. What what game are you expecting against Vincent Company's championship leaders? Yeah, I think Alvarez will play. Um but I wouldn't be surprised if Haaland played as well, just because he absolutely loves to play. Um they'll have had three days 
three full days between between the games. There's a late kickoff on Saturday as well, isn't it? So um, there is, you know, good reason to to play Harlem, but they will also kind of be looking at what his his schedule is looking like um, and how his his fitness is. Because I mean, that has been a bit of a, an underrated triumph for City as well. The fact that they've been able to get Harlem to turn out. For so many games, um, I think Rodri's maybe the only outfield player that has played more than him this season. So uh, probably nobody was expecting that. But yeah, you would be expecting Alvarez to come in. You would expect kind of um, Calvin Phillips to get at least a good chunk of minutes. Um, we kind of saw last night, didn't we, with Leipzig, how Phillips and Gomez and um, Alvarez came on. Uh, once once the tie was all was all wrapped up, you'd think it's kind of perfect for Riyad Mahrez to get a game again um, after sitting out more games than he would like in recent weeks, and kind of surely I merit Laporte could could start a game. Um, you know, not to it's not disrespecting um, Burnley because these are all you know top class international players, but at the same time. Uh, they are a championship side. There is a gulf there in quality that should be shown whoever City put on the pitch. And, and it is a really good opportunity to um, to just kind of help a few players feel a bit more included than, than they have been in recent weeks. Yeah, I think Laporte's one especially who's, I think it's five of the last 20 games he started. He's just been overlooked. And if, if Guardiola's playing four centre-backs and he's not even getting in in there, then I think he, he really, really needs a start to to just remind the manager what, what he can offer. And yesterday he didn't even get out of his big winter coat in the warm-up. I think he just knew he wasn't he wasn't going to play. But no, I, th- I think you're right. It's going to be a, a few changes, but not a weak side at all. And, and Burnley this season, they're not the Burnley who've come to the Etihad in the past who've stuck 11 men behind the ball they, they will probably try and get the foot on the ball and, and attack and, and Vincent Company has attracted a lot of praise for what he's managed to do with a Burnley side who were relegated pretty hopelessly last season after getting rid of Sean Dyche he's completely transformed them the miles clear at the top of the championship they look like they're heading for the Premier League and uh, Guardiola went and said that it's company's destiny to, uh, to manage City um, he unhelpfully said it not immediately before the game where it would have been a fantastic line this weekend but still it's quite significant isn't it for for Guardiola to say that this this player this manager could be a future City manager now company has come out and said no listen I'm still a championship manager and City deserve the best manager in the world at the moment that's Pep when Pep leaves they will need to have the best manager in the world and that's not him at the moment so he's ruled it out for the time being let's say but do you, do you think this is going to be a case of uh, a potential successor to Guardiola coming to the Etihad? I can't think of anyone who, you know, the the decision makers at City would love to be manager and be a successful manager at City than Vincent Company. Um, you know, there are a few kind of like Guardiola legacy candidates or City legacy candidates as Patrick Vieira who Brian Marwood kind of brought through and is still still tipping to be a future City manager um, there is uh, Mikel Arteta obviously but those kind of links don't go beyond Guardiola um, and, and, and the current players um, And but company is the one where it would kind of be you know, really a, a consolidation of of the projects over the last fifteen years. Um, to have a a player who's been as good as City, um, as good as Company was for City, uh, to have him come back and manage them and and return as like as a successful coach, having learnt under the managers that he's learnt from, and especially Guardiola, um, but kind of make it his own way. Um, we spoke last week on the podcast, I think, about how companies kind of tried his best not to pretend he's kind of city light and he's he's had success with that and um yeah, like everyone will be delighted to see him on Saturday, um, back in the ground. I'm sure he'll get a fantastic reception. And there is you, you know, you can never say um 
never say you know yes he will replace Guardiola or he will be a city manager um because it, it these things are so dependent on results and he's having a really good year and you know what happens if he takes them up and then Burnley are rock bottom 20th in the Premier League are, are people still saying um he he should be city manager but I mean I saw him touted this week for the Spurs job so you know clearly his his reputation um is is growing and the fact that he's a big name will ensure that he's kind of in those conversations anyway so you know he like I say he will be a very 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 popular appointment and it's going to be exciting for everyone on Saturday to see how far uh, he has brought a Burnley team that like you say uh, people are used to seeing play a very different way at the Etihad I, I, I always think those sort of games are so much better to watch when a team will come and you know that they're going to have a go at City like we saw it a little bit with Leipzig I think I remember an equivalent game was it Fulham last season in, in the cup they were top of the championship and because they were used to winning games and had their style they played sort of a bit, a bit more open yes City won but it was just a lot better to watch. It's always just refreshing when a team comes and, and, and has a go and it'll be re- hopefully refreshing to see a Burnley team do that until I'm sure after I've said that now they will uh, just park the bus and, and, and try and ground out a result as, as a typical Burnley side, if you like, always always do. But no, I think it will be a, a really interesting game, but one that City know that they are um, a division above and, and, and should win and take the emotion out and, and just try and get, get to Wembley. And I, I think if anything other than a than a City win will be a, a disappointment. But if they do get that, it will be... It'll keep City season alive, as Guardiola says. He said he wants to to get City uh, past the international break in those three competitions, just to keep the winning feeling going. And uh, it it's going to be important for City to just put the Leipzig result behind them, get get this one uh, done professionally. It's a completely different kind of game. I think Burnley are bringing about eight thousand fans, aren't they? So that should be a a good atmosphere at, at the Etihad, and uh, it should be a a cracking FA Cup tie and one that should potentially lead to. Uh, to a Wembley semi-final so if you want to follow uh, the City Burnley game build up and reaction you can do so on the Manchester Evening News on uh, Twitter on Facebook and on our YouTube channel um, we have Twitter so I'm at underscore Joe Bray Simon you are S-P-B-A-J-K-O nice and easy that, that one and uh, yeah we will bring you all of the uh, FA Cup uh reaction and potentially a uh, draw obviously the Champions League draw as well um, and all of that will be with you on Manchester Evening News so thanks for joining us and we will join you again next week Mm -hmm.